Tonight's speaker is Dr. Heidi Hamill. Dr. Hamill is a renowned planetary scientist and public speaker whose research focuses on the outer planets of our solar system. She currently serves as the Executive Vice President of the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, or ORA. ORA operates the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, which includes Kitt Peak in the Northern Hemisphere and Cerro Tololo in the Southern Hemisphere, the Gemini Observatory, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the National Solar Observatory, and the Space Telescope Science Institute. She is also Vice President of the Planetary Society, which is the largest public space organization on our planet. <laughs> Dr. Hamill is, also, is very widely known for her work with the Hubble Space Telescope, including her role in observing the impact of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 on Jupiter, and is one of the central figures in the development of the James Webb Space Telescope. She received the 1996 URA Prize from the American Astronomical Society's Division for Planetary Sciences, was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2000, and received the 2002 Carl Sagan Medal for Outstanding Communication by an Active Planetary Scientist to the general public. She has also been widely profiled and recognized in the popular press. It's a very great privilege to have her here with us tonight. Please welcome Dr. Heidi Hamill. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I've never given a talk in the round before, so this is a new experience for me. Um, but we'll work with it and make it happen. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about a project that I consider one of my children. I have three official children, one of whom is sitting here in the audience, came with me to Portland. Um, but I've been working on this project for well over 10 years now, so I consider it another child of mine, the James Webb Space Telescope. And I actually wanted to show you why I am working on the James Webb Space Telescope. And it really starts 10 or 20 years ago. And so, uh, literally, like 20 years ago to, I don't know, like right about now, this, like, this month, January, February, um, I got a phone call from Space Telescope Science Institute, and they Uh, what I did studying Jupiter is only one of hundreds, thousands of things that Hubble does. Uh, these are these words, dark energy, supermassive black holes, discovering the moons of Pluto, finding out the age of the universe. I could read them on and on and on. At the bottom it says, and much, much more. Uh, that's what I do. I do the much more stuff. I haven't done much. Well, it does have words Jupiter and Uranus and things. 
Um, but Hubble does all of it. That's what makes it a great observatory. Anybody who has a good idea proposes to Hubble. And if it's a good enough idea, it'll get selected. And so thousands of astronomers every year respond to the call for proposals. And of the thousands who respond, a couple hundred maybe will get time on Hubble. So it's, it's competitive, but it's the best science in the world. And so that's what makes a great observatory. Um, you've all seen this fabulous picture, Pillars of Creation. This is stars being born in the tips of these. There's a super massive star here blowing a wind down here. And where the clouds are very dense, the wind doesn't blow it away. So the tip of every one of these is a star being born. Here's a beautiful map of the Orion Nebula. And if you look closely in here, if you zoom in, you see things like this and this, and this, and this, and there are hundreds of them. And what these are, we call them proplids, which stands for protoplanetary disks. These are disks that are forming around stars. These are the nascent planetary systems. Someday these will be solar systems of their own right. And there's just dozens of them, just in that one particular nebula. I love this image. I love showing pictures of stars that are dying. It's a little grim, but it's very beautiful. This one is the Eskimo Nebula. Some of you may have actually done some astroimaging of that. Has anyone here ever done that? Not yet. We'll work on it, because it's, it's, it's not going to be as beautiful as this, because this is Hubble, but it's still really very beautiful. Um, this is one of my absolute favorites. I actually took a picture of this when I was in graduate school. This just, just was so cool. It's the Cat's Eye Nebula. And this is, a, this is a star that is exploding shells of stuff out of it, and repeatedly ex exploding and sending out this material. Gorgeous things. Here's another very beautiful nebula. These are all Hubble images, and I show them because they're beautiful. Um, but here's a really neat sequence of images showing a star that has gone nova and is expanding shells and material. These are Hubble images taken over a period of several years. And here is another example of science that Hubble does. Um, it takes images of galaxies, and we look for little variable stars inside there. And by looking at how these stars vary, we know how bright they are. They're called Cepheid variables. They're like little clocks for us. All right? And we look at them in other galaxies, and that allows us to determine the distance to those other galaxies. And we also look at stars called supernovae. When these supernovae explode, they have a very characteristic brightness. They only go to such and such a level of brightness. And by looking at more distant galaxies, if you see the supernova in that other galaxy and it's fainter, but you know how bright it's supposed to have been, you can figure out the distance to that galaxy. And that is how we figure out distances to things. And here is a bunch of images, of Hubble images, pre-explosion, post-explosion. Look, there's a supernova. Here's another one. You can't see it. That's not such a good one. Look at this one. Here's a galaxy. And in this galaxy, there's the supernova. And again, here, and here, and here, and here. And by studying these supernovae, we are mapping out the size of the universe and the age of the universe and learning some amazing things in the process. Uh, but I wanted to return to my own experience with Hubble just to finish off this little segment about Hubble. Um, this is when we were waiting for our first image of Jupiter. Here's Jupiter on the computer screen here. You doing that, Mark, on the other side? Great. Um, and that's me sitting in the front row because I was the leader of the team. And everybody else was in the background saying, what? This is Melissa. What are you seeing? In fact, what we were looking for is that we, we actually saw this bright spot on the edge of Jupiter. That's, so you don't see it there because it hasn't happened yet. But there it is. And what this is, is a gigantic plume when this big fragment of this comet smashed into Jupiter. It made such a massive explosion that that plume blew out material 3,000 miles above the cloud tops of Jupiter. And you're seeing the tip of it sticking out. And in fact, that was just the beginning. As our time sequence went on, you could see it got bigger and bigger, 
And then eventually it collapsed onto the planet. This giant plume collapsed onto the planet. Um, and what you're seeing here, we call it pancaking. But that's what these black things were. These black things were these plumes that collapsed onto the planet. And look at this one. You see the ring? That's the waves that that guy predicted. <laughs> we actually saw them. And as time went on, those were written, they got bigger and bigger, just like ripples in a pond, just like he said. It was amazing. I'm like, oh, my, he's great. All right, so he was totally successful. It was an amazing experiment. Um, just to give you guys a sense of scale and why this was important to us on Earth. This happened in 1994, almost 20 years ago. In this July, it will be the 20th anniversary. To give you a sense of scale of how big these are, you see these pictures of the Jupiter, and most people don't really have a sense of scale. So, so my friend John Spencer took this particular image, the G impact site, and he mapped it to scale on the planet Earth. And that's what you see. So 20 years ago, most of the people in this room were alive. Had this event happened on Earth and not Jupiter, this is what we in the biz call a biosphere changing event. <laughs> and do you know what that really means? You all die. That's what happened to the dinosaurs, we believe, 65 million years ago. All right? One of these events happened, and the dinosaurs all died. The mammals survived. That's us. All right? But this, this, isn't, this isn't ancient history, people. This was 20 years ago. And not only that, but it happened again just a few years ago. In 2009, uh, there was a report from an amateur astronomer saying, I saw this dark spot on Jupiter, and we all checked it out, and, you know, it seemed to be real, so we commandeered the Hubble. You can see, there I am. I was leading the team. We commandeered Hubble, and we took these images, and sure enough, it was another impact site that had happened on Jupiter. All right, so... After my own experience with the Hubble Space Telescope, now you understand I had nothing to do with building this amazing facility. I was just, as you saw in the picture, some young whippersnapper who had just gotten her PhD, and here was an amazing telescope for me to use. And so what I decided was that I wanted to help build the next great observatory for all the young whippersnappers who are out there right now, who 10 years ago were still in elementary school, um, and who are now in graduate school, and they're on the verge of becoming young postdocs in a couple of years. I want them to have the same opportunity that I did to have an amazing telescope. And now I wanted to build that next generation great observatory. That is why I have been spending over a decade working on this project. So let me tell you about the James Webb Space Telescope. You can see from this picture that it doesn't look like the telescopes you are used to. There's no tube. Here's the mirror, but it's not silver. It's covered in gold. Um, it's got all these sun shields. It's big. Uh, it's not going to be on the Earth. Here's the Earth and the moon. There's the sun. We're going to go through all these details, but it's a very different kind of telescope. It's going to do different stuff than Hubble. Um, but first, who was James Webb? Some of you guys might know this. Some of you older folks remember James Webb. I didn't know. I got an email one day when I was on the team. They said, your telescope, the next generation space telescope, is now going to be called the James Webb Space Telescope. So we did what anybody would do in that circumstance. We went to Google. Well, who was James Webb? I didn't know because he was a NASA administrator, 61 to 68, and I was only a little kid then, so I didn't know of him. But he was the architect of the Apollo space program. He was the man who made it happen. He actually put it together, supervised it. He's the one they tell the apocryphal story of. You know, they told him how much it was going to cost. And then in the taxi over to the White House, he doubled the cost. And then they asked him how much he doubled what they said it was going to be. All right, so that, he's the guy. But more important for us, the reason we're naming our space telescope after him is really not because of Apollo, but because he was a staunch advocate of space science. Under his tenure, while they were crafting the Apollo mission to send people to the moon, he also initiated dozens and dozens of space science missions. 
spacecraft to Mars, spacecraft to the moon, spacecraft to explore robotically throughout the solar system. He strongly believed in that. And that is what, that is the reason that we are honored to have our telescope named after James Webb. So, Webb has two special attributes. These are sort of the fundamental reasons we're building it. And I'm going to show you the words, but then I'm going to explain them if you didn't get it. First of all, Webb will see the universe in infrared light. That is different from Hubble. Hubble is a visible telescope for the most part. It also does ultraviolet, does a little bit of near infrared, but it's mostly visible. And with this infrared capability, Webb will peer back in time to the first light in the universe. That is the fundamental scientific reason that Webb was built. It was, we called it for our nickname for it, it was the first light machine. All right, so what does all that mean? For those of you who are not specialists in infrared, let's talk about light. All right, there's more to light than meets the eye. Our eyes are sensitive to visible light, but Newton did a very famous experiment where he put a prism in the wall, he spread out the light in a rainbow, and that rainbow of light is what we call the visible electromagnetic spectrum. However, light doesn't just stop at red or blue, all right? To our eyes it does, but in fact there's a whole spectrum of colors out there, and you've heard these words, and they're just different kinds of light. They are words like UV ultraviolet, x-rays, infrared, microwave. Who has a microwave oven? You're using light. You're using light to heat your food. It's just microwave wavelengths, longer wavelengths, and radio wavelengths. You all heard, heard radios. Right? This is all different colors of light. And astronomers don't care only about visible. They want to study things at all the different colors of light. So we build radio telescopes, we build x-ray telescopes, we build ultraviolet observatories. Hubble is primarily visible and a little bit of ultraviolet and a little bit of near-infrared. So just a little bit longer than the red your eyes can see, Hubble can see there. But there's lots of great stuff to do in the infrared. And here's an example from the Earth. If you have only visible light, and you're looking at this guy with this bag on his arm, all you see is the bag. But if you had an infrared camera, or if you were a mosquito who can see at infrared wavelengths, you would see this. You see right through the bag. Because infrared light is heat. And the heat comes through the plastic. So if you have an infrared camera and you take a picture like this, you can see that. And sometimes they do, if I, if I had an infrared camera, we could, you know, prove this to you. But take my word for it, the picture's not me. It's real. All right. So, infrared light reveals things that you can't see in visible light. And that's true in the sky, too. Here's a picture of the constellation Orion. How many of you have seen this constellation? Lots of you. This is a visible wavelength picture, and of course, in the sky, it doesn't have those blue lines on it, right? All right, all right. But if you had an infrared camera on your telescope, and your telescope was optimized to reflect infrared light, this is what you would see. That's the same constellation. Here's the Orion Nebula. You know, this is a big, giant cloud of gas and dust. And right in here, in this nebula that many of you have probably imaged with your own cameras, you are seeing a little opening in this giant cloud of dust. And you're seeing into the heart of that nebula. All right. So, the Webb telescope is being designed to work at these infrared wavelengths. We're going to peer through these dust envelopes. That's what we're trying to do. It's one of the things we're going to do. So that's, that's infrared light. Is everyone okay with that? Right, okay. So now let's talk about something called spectroscopy. Really important. It's like the astronomer's fundamental tool. Everybody loves the images from Hubble, and I love them too, but astronomers live on spectroscopy. 
because spectroscopy allows you to do chemistry in the solar system and the world and the universe beyond. So here's how it works. I'm only showing you a little bit of visible light here, but this is true throughout the infrared and in the ultraviolet. Materials absorb light. It's like fingerprints. And there's actually a fabulous exhibit here in the museum about this. Some materials absorb certain colors of light, certain molecules, when they vibrate, they suck up light in the infrared, and they leave little gaps in the spectrum. Other materials, under other conditions, can emit light. And there's a great one here in the laser exhibit, here in OMSI. Go to the laser room, the laser holography room, and you'll see they have uh, lasers that show you the bright lights from argon, bright lights from neon, bright lights, I can't remember all the things, and my son has fallen asleep, so he can't remind me either. Um, when, when we actually do it in astronomy, we don't show rainbows like this. What we do is we take a line, we measure the brightness at each different wavelength. So when there's light missing, your, your light disappears. And in this case, when there's extra light, your line goes up. So here's a plot. We call it a spectrum. And so it's the normal brightness, but when there's missing light, it goes down. When there's extra light, it goes up. And these are characteristic patterns. If you see some certain pattern in, this, in your spectrum, you know what it is. You know it could be argon. Or you know it is methane. Or you know it is helium. In fact, this, the word helium came from astronomers who were looking at the sun with their spectroscopes, and they saw these lines, and they didn't know what they were. And they called them helium lines, helios from the sun, helios. All right. So this is what we do. When we look at a star or a galaxy or a nebula and we see these patterns, we know what the composition is. It's incredibly powerful. You don't need to go to another planet to figure out if there's water on it. You can look for the water absorption lines. So by taking these lines and looking at these patterns, for a nearby star, you'll see these patterns, and I call these alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, because astronomers like to use Greek letters. It goes back to the early times. But astronomers noticed something very interesting. When they looked at a galaxy, the lines were shifted a little bit. And when they looked at a very distant galaxy, the lines were shifted even more. And when they looked at a really, really distant galaxy, the lines shifted far to the red. This is what we call redshift. 